Hi there, Mr. Holcomb here with another episode of The Math Behind the Modules. This is lesson four, more examples of functions. Okay, so in lesson two and three, we talked about dropping a ball from the rooftop um, and realized that as speed increased, or as the ball dropped, speed increased. And then we were discussing bags of candy and cost in dollars. And the bags and candy were a linear equation. And then the dropping the ball was a quadratic equation, which was, so the two equations were, if you don't remember, y equals 1.25x for the bags of candy. And for the other equations, y equals 16x squared. So this is a power of 1. So this was linear, and this is exponential. Okay, so we're going to keep this in mind for a moment here. They're both linear equations. I can plug in any value, but there was a restriction. You can't buy negative numbers of bags, and you can't um, have negative time. So there were restrictions on these two equations where x had to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so I couldn't have time being zero negative and I couldn't have number of bags I purchased being negative. It just does not make sense in the context of the problem. Now we're leading up to something else. So now it says in example one, classify each of the functions described below as either being discrete or not discrete. So these are new definition words. So if I bring in the um, definition, it would look like this. Okay, right here. So we're talking about discrete or not discrete. And by definition, the word discrete in English means individually separate or distinct. Okay, if a function admits only individual separate input values, like whole number counts of candy bags, for example, then we say we have a discrete function. If a function admits over a range of values, any input value within that range, all fractional values too, for example, then we have a function that is not discrete. So if we have fractions that we can substitute in or decimals, then it is not discrete. If we're only talking about positive integers or whole numbers, then it is discrete. Okay, so Functions that describe motion, for example, are typically not discrete because motion, we can type in a half a second, a tenth of a second. Stopwatches go out to hundreds or even thousandths. If you watch the Olympics recently, um, there are definitely decimals in time. So they are non-discrete functions. Okay, so hopefully you understand that. So now pause the video with this definition and see if you can answer these questions on whether they are discrete or non-discrete functions. Okay, so here we go. A, the function that assigns each whole number the cost of buying that many cans of beans in a particular grocery store. Okay, so I would say that would be discrete because it's whole numbers. B, the function that assigns to each time of day, one Wednesday, uh, 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 yeah, one Wednesday, the temperature of Sammy's fever at that time. So temperature, average temperature of a human body is 98.6 degrees. So that's a decimal or a fraction, non-discrete. C, the function that assigns to each real number its first digit. Okay, any real number can be one, pi is real, so 3.14159, since we're approaching that date, pi is real. So if we assign each real number its first digit, the function that assigns to each real number its first digit can be a decimal. Okay, so that is non-discrete. The function that assigns to each day in the year, 2015, my height at noon that day. Okay, well, if we're only breaking up the days, then it's 1 through 365. Those are all positive integers. I would call that a discrete function. Okay. The function that assigns to each moment in the year, 2015, my height at that moment. Okay. 
so E, again, like we said, a moment can be a stopwatch. So it could be decimals. So that would be non discrete. Okay, F, the function that assigns to each color the first letter of the name of that color. Okay, the function that assigns to each color the first letter of the name of that color. That would be discrete. G, the function that assigns the number 23 to each and every real number between 20 and 30.6. So that's a decimal and there are decimals in between. So that would be non discrete. H, the function that assigns the word yes to every yes or no question. Well, there's no fractions or decimals. It's either yes or no. So I would say that would be discrete. And finally, the function that assigns to each height directly above the North Pole, the temperature of the air that height right at this very moment. Okay, so obviously temperatures can be decimals just like up in B. So this would be non-discrete. Okay, example two, water flows from a faucet into a bathtub at a constant rate of seven gallons of water every two minutes. So that would be y equals seven halves x. Regard the volume of water accumulated in the tub as a function of the number of minutes the faucet has to be on, or has the faucet has be on. <laughs> Let's read that again. Regard the volume of water accumulated in the tub as a function of the number of minutes the faucet has be on, <laughs> has been on. Is this function discrete or non-discrete? Well, can it be on for a half a minute? And the answer is yes. So if I can type in fractions of minutes or substitute in, then this is non-discrete. We can get decimals or fractions input and output. Okay, example three. You have just been served freshly made soup that is so hot that it cannot be eaten. You measure the temperature of the soup and it is 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Since 212 degrees Fahrenheit is boiling, there is no way it can safely be eaten yet. One minute after receiving the soup, the temperature has dropped to 203 degrees Fahrenheit. If you assume that the rate at which soup cools is constant, write an equation that would describe the temperature of the soup over time. Okay, so if you look at this, when you received it, it was 210 degrees Fahrenheit. One minute after receiving it, it had dropped to 203. So it went from 210 to 203 degrees. That is a drop in seven degrees, okay? So if I set up an equation, y equals the decrease in temperature is our coefficient, negative seven degrees per minute. So if this is one, it'd be down seven degrees. If it was two, it'd be down 14 degrees and so on, okay? But at the time we received it, it was 210 degrees. So it'd be negative seven X plus 210, or you could write it like this, Y equals 210 minus seven X. I prefer this because it's in slope intercept form. And if we're asked to graph it, it's more clear how to do that. Okay, so there is an equation. Example four, consider the function that assigns to each of nine baseball players, numbers one through nine, his height. The data for this function is given below Call the function g. Okay, here's example four. It says to consider the function that assigns to each of nine baseball players, the number one through nine, his height. The data for the function is given below. Call the function g. And so keep in mind that this is x and this is y. So this is our input data and this is what we get out. So I'm not sure of a way that we could come up with an equation for this because of so many different um, variables into determining why someone is as tall as they are and so forth. Plus, these players were just arbitrarily chosen randomly. So player number one through player number nine does not mean that player number nine could have been second and player number two somewhere else and so forth. So rearranging these X's so if I am player number nine, I could also have been chosen for number two or number one and be up here. So therefore my height would have to go with me. And I can't assign two to any other value here at the same time because one person can't be two different heights. 
So for example, I could not say player number two is five foot four and player number two is five foot nine inches tall. There's no way one person can be five inches taller than they were before or at the same time or so forth. So this is really not anything that we could set up as a function, but if we did call this a function g, we don't have a formula that we could actually come up with, but we can determine whether or not it is discrete. And since we have input integers positive or whole numbers, no fractions or decimals, this is a discrete function. We just don't know how to come up with a formula for this function. Okay, exercises one through three says, at a certain school, each bus and its fleet of buses can transport 35 students. So 35 students per bus. So that's what we have here. Number of buses, one, students, 35. Let B be the function that assigns to each count of students the number of buses needed to transport that many students on a field trip. When Jinpyo thought about matters, he drew the following table of values and wrote the formula B equals X over 35. The number of buses equals some value X over 35. Here X is the count of students and B is the number of buses needed to transport that many students. He concluded that B is a linear function. Okay, so then Alicia, so this would be rewritten as if B were Y and X we could write as 1 over 35 x so if there were 35 students 1 35th times 35 is one bus okay 70 times 1 over 35 is 2 so that'd be two buses and so forth okay so now alicia looked at his work and saw no errors with his arithmetic but she said that the function is not actually linear alicia is right explain why b is not a linear function okay so can you come up with a reason why this is not linear because it is not. Okay. Here's the reason it's not linear. How many buses do you need if we have 35 students? And the answer is one. The bus can hold 35 students. Okay. So now what if I have 40 students? How many buses can, do I need? Well, 35 will go on the first bus, and then five would have to go on a second bus. So what's going to happen here is if we tried to graph this, where this is X and this is Y. And number of buses, B is my Y. So I'll, let's change that to B instead of X and Y. It's X and B. So let's put a B up here. So what we're saying is at 35, or if we don't have any students, we don't need a bus. That's true. But then if we go out to 35, let's say this was 35, then we need one bus. Okay, but if we have 34 students, we still need a bus. If we have 33, 32, if we have one student, we need to put them on a bus. So the line looks like this. But then once we get past 35 to say up to 70, 36 to 70, we would have to jump up to two buses and then it would look like this. Okay, so 36 people, we would need two buses. All the way up to 70 people, we would need two buses. So then if I went another 105, so if I get to 71, if the, the limit is 35 per bus and I have 71 students, well, 35 times two is 70, but as soon as I have one more student over that limit, I need another bus. So now I'm up here and I only need one bus for anywhere from one to 35 students. So this is going to, this is called a step function. Okay, so it is not linear and that is the reason. And the, now the question is, is B a discrete function? Well, what are we substituting in is number of students. Can we have half a student or a quarter of a student? Um, no. So since we are just dealing with whole numbers, this is discrete. Okay, number two, a linear function has a table of values below. It gives the cost of purchasing certain numbers of movie tickets. So here it is. Number of tickets, three, cost $27.75. Six tickets cost $55.50. Nine cost $83.25. And 12 tickets cost $111. Write the linear function that represents the total cost, y, for tickets purchased, x. So remember that our slope 
or our C, our constant of proportionality, or our C, which also stands for constant rate of change, then we would say C or M for our slope equals Y over X. And since we have a Y and an X here, then I can substitute in 27, 75 over 3. And then when I cross multiply and then divide, what we're really do saying is that C is or M is this fraction. So Y equals M 27.75 over 3 times X. And when I divide that by 3, 3 goes into 27 nine times. 3 goes into 7 two times with a remainder of 1, and 3 will go into 15 five times. So the equation is y equals 9.25x, and now I will use my calculator to check that. Okay, so now I have my calculator here, so I want to see if 3 times 9.25 is that. Well, it should be. I just calculated that, but let's check our other values. So if I plug in 12, what's 9.25 times 12? So 9.25 times 12 should be 111, and it is. Okay, 9.25 times 9 is 83.25, and 9.25 times, whoops, 6 times 6 is 55.50. So that does check. So now that I've done that, this is a linear equation. And is the function discrete? Well, to determine discrete, you have to look at what values you're substituting in. And my numbers of tickets is an integer. I cannot buy a half a ticket. So this is discrete. You can't buy fractions of tickets. So it is discrete. Okay, part C. What number does the function assign to 4? What number does the function assign to 4? In other words, how much would 4 tickets cost? So we'd say y equals... 9.25 times 4. Okay, so 9 times 4 is 36, and 25 cents times 4 is a dollar, so that would come out to be $37. What do the question and your answer mean? Well, th what does the number of function assign to 4? 4 is number of tickets. And the value we received from substituting that in is the cost of four tickets. Okay, number three. A function produces the following table of values, banana, B, cat, C, flippant, F, oops, O, slushy, S. Make a guess as to rule the function follows. Each input is a word from the English language. So I would guess that the output is the first letter of each word. Is this function discrete? Well, we're inputting words. They aren't fractions or decimals, so that is discrete. Okay. All right, that is the end of lesson four. Review your lesson summary and go do your problem set.